This, this slide, there were several questions yesterday, and let's try to answer them for everyone, or at least everyone that's here. This slide is just an example, an example of using stop and wait under different conditions, and it's not complete. That is, at the end, there's some data to send. We send it in a data frame. You should complete or you should know what happens after this. I have not completed that the data is propagated and that comes back. There may be more data and it may go forever. If we've got a continuous amount of data to send, we just keep going. So there is an act that comes back eventually. I just didn't show it on this example. I ran out of space. So that was the first point. Uh, in the example yesterday, it, we come up with a diagram which was similar to this and we did some calculations. The scenario is that we had three, three messages to send or a total of 3,000 bytes. So if we summarize our diagram, it looked a little bit like this. But I'll just draw it to a smaller uh, scale than yesterday. You don't have to draw it again. We had data one and an act, data two and an act, data three and an act. All right, but we did it over two diagrams and we did it in more detail and we worked out the total time from the start zero to when we received the first eight act was eight three four one and then I've got to answer to when we received the second act so immediately when we receive the first act we can send the next frame and if we do all the calculations transmission propagation processing is in here act comes back it was 16682. And then the third frame, it finished at 25023. And what we notice this time to transmit the first data is 8341 microseconds. This time from here to here is another 8341 and another 8341. It's the same duration. The data size is the same, the propagation delay is the same. Everything's the same in terms of the numbers. We just repeat. So if we look at it from the sender's perspective, here we had 3,000 3, bytes to transmit. The data, the data frame contained 1,000 bytes of real data and 20 bytes of header. Let's concentrate on the real data. Each data frame contained a thousand bytes of real data. Let's extend this and let's say we don't have three three thousand bytes, we have three million bytes. You would just keep drawing the same pattern. If we had another thousand bytes to send it would be data act, data act and we just keep going. And each phase of data propagation act, propagation back, takes 8341 microseconds. Doesn't matter how many times we repeat this. So if we look on average, the average rate at which data is being sent, the source is sending 1,000 bytes of real data every 8341 microseconds. 1,000 bytes is sent, then over this period, we send another 1,000 bytes. Then over this period, another 1,000. We're sending 1,000 bytes every 8,341 microseconds. If you look at the receiver, B, the same concept applies. Every 8,341 microseconds, we were receiving 1,000 bytes of real data. We receive the data here. Then we send an ACK, we're waiting, and then we receive the data from B's perspective. Then we receive the data 
and so on if we kept transmitting data. From the receiver's perspective, every 8341 microseconds, that's a microseconds, we receive 1,000 bytes of real data. Not data frames, but data inside those frames. And that's our measure of throughput. Throughput is the rate at which we receive real data. So in this period, we receive 1,000 bytes. And then in the next period, another 1,000 bytes is transferred. And then another 1,000 bytes, if we kept going, it would be the same duration. So therefore, our throughput is simply every 8341 microseconds receive 1,000 bytes of data, which is 1,000 bytes divided by 8341 microseconds, which is approximately what we calculated yesterday, 959, 959 something, 117 bits per second. 959 kilobits per second. That's the average rate at which we're receiving the real data. If doesn't matter if this question was three bytes, or three 1,000 byte messages, 300 messages, or three million messages. We get the same behavior, and the throughput would be the same. Throughput of 959 kilobits per second. The maximum data rate was one million bits per second. We could say there's an efficiency that is, how much of that data rate do we use to transfer real data? It's simply this divided by one megabit per second, which is, as a percentage, this divided by one million is 95.9%. We could say the efficiency of using that link is 95.9%. That comes from, or the, the way to visualize that efficiency, although our diagram's not for scale, 95.9% means of this period of time, 95.9% of it, we're sending real data. The other 4.1%, we're either sending header or we're waiting. We're not sending anything. So in fact, throughput and efficiency, we need to include the time of not sending anything. Before the midterm, you calculate a throughput as simply take the size of real data divided by the total size of the frame. But when we have to wait for an act, we need to include the time that we don't send anything. That is, if we, if this was the time transmitting the header, this is the time spent waiting, then over this total time here, the efficiency is this time spent transmitting real data divided by the total time. We'd like to minimize the time spent sending the header and minimize the time spent waiting. If I talk to you and then wait for 30 minutes for a response, the amount of information we transfer in this lecture will be very low. Our efficiency will be low. So minimize the waiting time increases the throughput. Given that, how do we improve upon the efficiency in this case? What are the factors that impact upon the efficiency? We'll explain them and then we'll go through some examples that illustrate them. How do we calculate efficiency or even throughput? We see it's the total amount or the best case efficiency or throughput, the amount of real data divided by the time spent sending and waiting. That is, this is the real data, 8341 was the sum of these times. Transmission, propagation, processing, act, propagation equals 8341. Here's a general equation that gives efficiency. 
where if data is the time spent sending real data, then the efficiency is the time spent sending real data divided by that plus the time spent sending header. That's an overhead. Plus the time spent sending the act. That's this part. That's an overhead. And plus the propagation of the data in one direction and the propagation of the act in the other direction. That is two times the propagation delay. This equation ignores the processing delay. In our previous example, we had a one microsecond processing delay. It's very small. So if we say it's zero, in general, we can say the efficiency depends upon the size of the data. Increasing the size of the data will increase efficiency. If we make this larger, this will go up. And decreasing the header, decreasing the size of the axe, and decreasing the propagation delay will also increase efficiency. The size of the data relative to the other components is the measure of efficiency. Let's illustrate that with just a, a quick extension of this example. Let's consider Let's consider the case where we increase the data size. The data frame in our previous case was 1,000 bytes plus 20 of header. Let's say the data frame is 10,000 bytes plus 20 bytes of header. Data or we often call it real data to make it clear that it's not the data frame. Everything else is the same. We'd get the same operation. We'd transmit, propagate, processing, act, come back, and then transmit, propagate, and so on. So the total time... Yesterday we had, well now we've got a transmission delay. We do the calculation again, a transmission delay of, now we have 10,020 bytes divided by one megabit per second, which is, I've done it before, that's 80,160 microseconds. So instead of 1,000 bytes of data, we now have 10,000 bytes of data. So a transmission delay now is 80,160. Yesterday it was 8,160. Propagation is the same. Everything else is the same. Same as yesterday, 10 microseconds. Transmission of the ACK, same as yesterday, 160 microseconds. And we had some processing one microsecond. All I've done is increase the amount of data we send per frame. So we just add up this time plus this plus add all these up and we've got 8160 plus 10 for propagation plus 1 for processing plus 160 for the act transmission plus another 10 to propagate and we add all them up and we get 80340341 the time it takes to transmit one data frame and receive the ACK is now 80341 microseconds Yesterday we had an answer of 8,341 microseconds. In this case, our throughput is now 10,000 bytes of real data every 80,341 microseconds. And 
with my calculator, that turns out to be 995756 bits per second, or an efficiency of 99.6% or 99.57%. All we've done is increased the size of the data in each frame from 1,000 bytes up to 10,000 bytes. Everything else is the same. If we perform the same calculations as yesterday, we get a throughput of 995 kilobits per second. Yesterday we got 959 kilobits per second. Increase the efficiency from 95% or 95.9% up to 99.6%. Almost 100% efficient. We cannot go more than 100%. So that's just an illustration. Make the data larger increases the efficiency. And you can also see, okay, what happens if I reduce the size of the header from 20 down to 10? Then you'd see a small increase in the efficiency. It might go from 99.6 or 995756 up to 9958 or so. A small the header is quite small relative to the other parts, so changing that doesn't have much impact on the efficiency. The other thing we could do, change the size of the ACK. Instead of 20 bytes, change it to 10 bytes. This would go from 160 down to 80. Total time would de decrease slightly. The efficiency will go up. Propagation delay. Let's revert back to our case yesterday. We had 8160, so back to 1,000 bytes. 8160 to transmit, but let's increase the propagation delay from 10 microseconds. Let's make it quite large and make it 1,000 microseconds. Actually, let's follow the example that I have. Let's make it 100 microseconds. Instead of 10 to propagate, it takes 100 to propagate. Transmit the data, propagate, processing, ACK, propagate. 8160 to transmit, 100 plus 1 of processing, plus 160 of the ACK transmission, plus another 100 to propagate. What do we get? Total time of 8521. Just add up those numbers. Yesterday we had a total time of 8341. We've increased the total time. Efficiency, running out of space. Throughput. Again, we still have 1,000 bytes of data transmitted every 8521 microseconds. Gives us approximately 938 kilobits per second or an efficiency of 93.8%. You can do the calculation later. 1,000 bytes divided by 8521 microseconds gives us an efficiency of 93.8%. Yesterday, we had an efficiency of 95.9%. If we increase the propagation delay from 10 up to 100 microseconds, the efficiency goes down to 93.8%. If we increase our data from 1,000 bytes up to 10,000 bytes, our efficiency goes up to 99.6%. Just illustrating the impact of especially the data size and the propagation delay. Because the header is usually very small 
and the act is usually very small, they have little impact on the efficiency in practice. The main things are the data size and the propagation delay. And it's summarized here. Using stop and wait flow control, we can be efficient or have high efficiencies when the data transmission time, that is when the data is much larger than the propagation time. That was the case that we have in all of these three examples. Data transmission time, 80,160. Propagation, 10. It's much larger. Efficiency, 99%. Even the other cases, transmission, around 8,000. Propagation, only 100. It's much, transmission time is much larger than propagation. Efficiency is still quite good around the 93, 95%. If you change the propagation delay instead of 100 to 1,000, then we'd still be larger, the efficiency would go down. If the propagation delay went up to 10,000, then most of the time would be spent waiting for the act. If this was 10,000, we'd transmit, long time to propagate and then a long time to get the act back and therefore would be very inefficient in that case. If the data transmission is larger than the propagation or much larger, generally we get high efficiency with stop and wait. The other way around, if we have a high propagation delay, stop and wait is inefficient. Satellite links. We have a large distance to the satellite, a large propagation delay. Stop and wait is generally inefficient with satellite links. Or if the data transmission time is very short, very small. If we had a very high data rate, one gigabit per second instead of one megabit per second, the data transmission time would go down. And so with very high data rate links, like optical fiber links, Again, stop and wait can be inefficient. So there are cases when stop and wait does not work so well. It makes very inefficient use of our links. We'd like to get more efficient use of our links. And in a moment, we'll look at an alternative protocol that can increase the efficiency. But before we do that, are there any questions on how stop and wait works? and how you calculate the throughput. You mean this? This is an A, that's just my bad writing. That's AC. Sorry, transmission time of the ACK, acknowledgement, not a P. In general, we always have the transmission time of the data, propagation, possibly some processing, but sometimes that's very small and we ignore that. Transmission time of the ACK and the propagation back. We want to maximize the transmission time of the data relative to the other part. That will give us better efficiency. Any other questions before we move on to the next approach? That was the easy protocol. Are you ready for the hard one? Why? What's difficult about it? Th this is the easy one. Oh, 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 oh. Be ready. oh you should be ready. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Uh, HDR is short for header in that case. Um, so here, data means in this equation the time to transmit the real data. 
we don't distinguish, but this data frame has two parts, header and real data. So HDR is short for the time to transmit the header. The larger the header, the less efficient will be. It is, if this goes up, efficiency goes down. So how can we improve this? All right, we've got those factors. What, what can we do to modify the protocol to improve it? Any last questions? Okay. The, in this case, although my diagrams are not to scale, if the propagation delay is large, what happens, we transmit one frame then we spend a lot of time waiting for the act. That's inefficient. Spending time not transmitting is inefficient. So one way to improve, even if we have a large propagation delay, allow the source to transmit more than one before waiting for the act. Transmit one and then two. Wait for the act and then transmit more. And that's what we'll see is the basic approach of the next protocol. I remember now, there was one more question yesterday. What happens if the memory is full? In the example you calculated or in, in this example as well, if we receive a frame, the memory available at the receiver is limited. If after receiving the frame, the memory becomes full, the buffer, that means we should not or we cannot receive any more. In that case, do not send the act. And that's illustrated here. We've received the frame. The buffer is now full. We wait for space to become available in the buffer. We do not immediately send the act. In this case, we wait some time before we send the act. This is the flow control working. B is not allowing A to send any more because its buffer is full. How do we make space available in the buffer? Well, when the receiver processes the data and sends it to the higher layer. So if the data is received, you've processed it, the higher layer accepts that data, then we remove it from the buffer and send to the higher layer and leave it there. So that's where I illustrate with this diagram an arrow saying data one was delivered to the higher layer. That makes space available in the buffer and therefore we send the act saying, now you can send another data frame because I have space available. So that's in fact the flow control working. The sending of the act depends upon how much space is available in the buffer. Let's look at our next. Let's skip this one for now. We may return to it later. Let's go straight to our next protocol. Sliding window flow control. Stop and wait flow control is one general mechanism. Send one data frame, stop and wait for the act. Send the next one, stop and wait, and so on. Sliding window allows multiple frames to be in transit at a time. Send three frames, stop and wait for an act send another three frames. Stop and wait limits to one frame at a time. Sliding window allows multiple frames to be transmitted before you have to wait for an act. That's the difference here. So in stop and wait, we had one frame in transit or outstanding. Transmit, that frame has been transmitted. We now have to wait. Sliding window, we can have multiple frames transmitted and then we will wait. And there's a limit on how many when we say multiple. For this to work, because we now transmit multiple frames and we're going to receive acts, we're going to need some numbers to identify those frames. 
to know that, okay, we transmit three frames. It's frame number one, frame number two, frame number three. And they are sequence numbers included in the frames. Let's draw a frame to illustrate that. I'll just leave this diagram here to, to remind us the problem with stop and wait. Transmit a frame. If the propagation delay is large, we have to wait a long time before we can send the next frame, leading to inefficient performance. We'll refer to that when we come go through sliding window. We've already said that the data frames that we send contain a header and some data. What's inside the header can be different things, including addresses, but one thing that we need with sliding window is a sequence number. A number to identify this frame in a sequence of frames. <coughs> the headers are of a particular size, so we have a, a limited size. And let's say of that header, we use k bits for the sequence number. So we have a, the header, k bits, where k is some constant, is used for the sequence number, seq. With a k bit sequence number, we can have up to 2 to the k, or we can have 2 to the k possible values. For example, if k equals 3, if we have a 3-bit sequence number, that is inside the head, header, we allocate 3 bits. Those 3 bits can take one of 8 possible values. The binary values, the decimal values. So 3 bits only of the header in this example, are used for the sequence number. Therefore, the sequence number can be one of eight possible values, 0 through to 7. So in general, with k bit sequence number, the sequence number can be from 0 through to 2 to the k minus 1. 2 to the power of 3 minus 1, in this case, is 7. And what we do is that we continue to use those same sequence numbers. So if I have... 10 frames to send, I have a lot of data to send, 10 frames to transmit. First frame would have sequence number 0, we start at 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, with our k equal 3 example, 7, they're the first 8 frames, the ninth frame would wrap back to one, 0, 1, and so on. We just wrap around once we get to the maximum value. So if I have 10 frames to send, we can think this is frame number one, the first frame. And sequence number one would be the 10th frame. So in the 10th frame, in the header, there will be three bits, giving the decimal value one. That's just how sequence numbers are used, not just in flow control, but in almost all protocols. Why do we use it? We use it to keep track of the frames which have been sent and those that have been acknowledged. In stop and wait, we could send one frame and then we had to wait for an acknowledgement. In a sliding window, we're allowed to send multiple frames. Let's say I send three frames 
and then receive an acknowledgement, we have some variables in the send and receiver to keep track of which frames have been sent, frames 0, 1 and 2, and which frames have been acknowledged. And we'll see that in the next slide. So that's just introducing that we need sequence numbers. Any questions so far? With k bits, we have 2 to the k possible values. So how does sliding window flow control work? Let's concentrate at the sender. The sender is allowed to send up to W frames. We'll define the value of W later, but in general, up to W frames without receiving an act. If W is 3, then the sender can send frame 1, frame 2, frame 3, and it cannot send frame 4 until it receives an act. In stop and wait, the sender could send frame 1, and then it has to wait. In sliding window, it can send W frames, and then wait. That's the difference. For this, for the protocol to work, the sender keeps track of or records some values that make the protocol work. It keeps track of the last frame that was acknowledged. So if we have a sequence of a large number of frames to be sent, at some point in time, we may have received an acknowledge for some frames. It keeps track of the sequence number of the last frame acknowledged and the last frame that's been transmitted and the current window size. And this diagram tries to illustrate that. The numbers, 0 through to 7, these indicate frames with their corresponding sequence numbers. So we may have sent many frames in the past. So at some point in time, frame with sequence number 0, 1, 2, 7, 0, 1, 2, 7, and can keep going in both directions. This shows us that the last frame transmitted has sequence number 7. The last frame acknowledged has a sequence number 5, a value of 5. So we keep track of what has been acknowledged. All of these have been acknowledged. Because we transmit frames in order, 0, 1, 2, 3, we should receive acknowledgements in order. So if frame 5 has been acknowledged, that implies also frame 4 has been acknowledged, the preceding frame. The destination will not send an acknowledgement for frame 5 if it hasn't received frame 4. So the sender knows the last frame acknowledged is 5, that it means all the preceding frames that it sent have also been acknowledged. So in this example, this is just one example, frame 5 has been acknowledged, which means that frame was successful. I sent the frame, I've received the act. Frame 6 and 7 have been transmitted but I haven't yet received the act. So at some point in time, I've sent and received the acts for all of these. I've transmitted two frames, six and seven. I haven't yet received the act. I'm allowed to send another five frames, zero, one, two, three, four. In this case, the maximum window size is seven. That is, we're allowed, the maximum number of frames we're allowed to have outstanding in this example is seven. We've got two outstanding. I've transmitted six and seven, which means I'm allowed to have another five. So at this point in time, I could transmit if I wanted to or if I had the data, frame zero and then one and then two and three and four. If I transmitted all those five frames, there would be seven frames transmitted, but not yet act, and therefore I'm not allowed to transmit any more. I need to wait for an act. If I receive an act 
for frame 6, then we can see that these values change. If I receive the act for frame 6, then the last frame act will now be 6. And you can think this solid bar would move to here. To the left of here are the frames that have been acknowledged. To the right have not been acknowledged. If I receive the act for frame 6, then that has been acknowledged as well. If I receive an act for frame 6, then only frame 7 is outstanding. And since we're allowed to send a maximum of 7 frames, I've sent frame with sequence number 7, I'm allowed to send another 6 frames, which would be 0 through to 5. And you would see that this blue box would cover 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We'll see some more examples of how this works. This is trying to introduce the concepts. That is, we keep track of the frames that have been acknowledged, the frame that, or the last frame transmitted, and the maximum, or this is the window. This blue box is the window. Our current window size is five. Last frame act is sequence number five. Last frame transmitted, transmitted, sequence number seven. Current window size is five frames. Means I'm allowed to send another five more frames. This blue box will not go larger than seven in this example. We'll see that why that's the case shortly. From the receiver, it's very similar concepts. The receiver has space in its buffer for up to W frames. So the buffer size, if W was 10, then the receiver can handle 10 frames in its buffer before the buffer would be full. So what the receiver does is it keeps track of the last frame acknowledged, the receiver receives a frame, sends back an act, then that frame is acknowledged. The last frame received, I may receive a frame, but I have not yet sent an act. And the current window size. Very similar diagram here to the previous slide. The receiver has received these frames and has acknowledged them. In the past, it received frame 0, sent an act. Frame 1, sent an act. Frame 5, sent an act. So the last frame acknowledged is frame 5 in this case. The receiver has received frame 6 and 7, but it has not yet sent an act. So the last frame received is recorded as 7. More specifically, you can think of this last frame received and not yet acknowledged. Because it's received two and not yet sent an act, it can handle another five. If our maximum window size is seven, same as the previous slide, we've received two, we expect in the future to receive another five. And this keeps track of those that we expect to receive. <coughs> we may come back to this, but let's use a more concrete example to illustrate this. It's a bit small, but you'll see it on your lecture notes. The source A and the destination B. And it's showing those values that we keep track of at both the source and destination, where the solid bar here, the frames to the left are frames that have been sent and acknowledged. The frames here to the right of the solid bar and left of the blue box have frames that have been sent but not yet acknowledged. And the blue box is the frames that we're allowed to send. Similar at the receiver. So this is just one example. And in this example, the maximum window size is seven. Just make note of that.
W max, just in this example, is 7. W is the number of frames we're allowed to send. The maximum is 7. And you'll see that's the initial state of both the source A and the destination B. The blue box contains seven frames, starting from frame zero through to frame six. So, which means source A is allowed to send frames zero through to six. That is a total of seven frames. Destination B ex expecting to receive frames zero through to six. We can also say that the destination B has a buffer of seven frames. That is, the buffer available at B can fit a maximum of seven frames. So in this case, A transmits three frames. It has some data to send to B, three frames worth. It's allowed to send seven, but it only has enough data to send three. So it sends frames zero, one, and two. So looking at the source, frames zero, one, and two have now been sent, but not yet act. We've sent them. So we see that the blue box moves along. Zero, one, and two are now in the set that have been sent, but not yet act. Since we're allowed to send a maximum of seven, or have a maximum of seven outstanding, we've got three frames outstanding, we're allowed to send another four. But at this point in time, time is increasing as we go down, A doesn't have any more data to send in this example. Although we're allowed to send another four, we cannot send anything if we have no data. So it's just one example illustrating how the window mechanism works. We've sent three frames. Eventually, they are received by B. B receives frame zero, one, and two, after which it knows that it's received zero, one, and two. It hasn't yet sent an acknowledgement for them. So it's expecting to receive another four frames in the future. If we think of the buffer at destination B, I'll try and draw it. buffer at B at this point in time has the frames F0, F1 and F2. We can fit seven frames in the buffer. We currently have three frames in the buffer. We can accept another four and then it would be full. And that's what this blue box indicates. We can accept another four frames. Then B sends back a special message. And it's an acknowledgement in this case. But instead of sending, in this example, instead of sending an axe for each frame received, it sends one axe which acknowledges all three frames. So this is a new mechanism. Receive three frames, send one axe, include in the axe, the sequence number of the next frame expected. We've received frames 0, 1, and 2. Send an act saying, I expect to receive frame 3 next. And that's a common way acknowledgements include numbers to acknowledge multiple frames. Because we re receive frames in order, if we've got 0, 1, and 2, the next one should be 3. So tell the sender the next one should be three. When the sender receives that, it knows. Ah, I have sent zero, one, and two. I just received an axe saying I'm allowed to send frame three. That must mean zero, one, and two were successful. So it, this one packet, or one frame, acknowledges these three data frames. So that's a new mechanism that we haven't seen before. It's an axe that acknowledges multiple frames at once. It saves on sending acts. An alternative, which is not shown here, we could have sent three acts. 
but it would be a waste in that case. It was better just to send one frame. So when we send that, B has, we see this solid line shift along. Previously, 0, 1 and 2 were in the buffer. They had not been act. When Once we send the act for them, 0, 1 and 2 are removed from the buffer. They are removed from the buffer because we've processed them. We send an acknowledgement saying, I now expect to receive frame 3. And so from B's perspective, it's expecting to receive frame 3 up until frame 0 because it's ex allowed to receive a maximum of 7. It has a buffer space of 7 frames. There are no frames in the buffer, therefore it's allowed to receive another 7. When this ACK is received by the destination A, Previously, frames 0, 1 and 2 were sent, but not yet act. We receive an act saying, I expect to receive frame 3. That implies frames 0, 1 and 2 have been acknowledged. So this solid line moves along. These now become frames that have been sent and acknowledged. And now we have, or we're allowed to send another 7 frames because the maximum size is 7, the double maximum size of the window is 7, the blue box is the window, it started out as 7 frames, after we sent 3 it reduced to 4 frames, as we received the ACK it increased, we see the window went from here and expanded out on the right hand side, and then we send 4 frames. We're allowed to send seven. We only have four frames of data, so we send frames three, four, five, and six. Three, four, five, and six. We send those four frames. After sending them from the source's perspective, three, four, five, and six are outstanding. Sent, but not yet act. I'm allowed to send seven, zero, and one. I don't have data to send seven, zero, and one but I'm allowed to. Destination B receives, just to show something different, it receives the first frame, frame 3, and decides for whatever reason to send an ACK immediately, which is slightly different from here. In this case, it received three frames and then sent an ACK. In this case, it receives frame 3, first frame, and then immediately sends an act before waiting for more to come. As a result, frame 3 is received and immediately act, and therefore frame 3 has been received and act, we we'll expect to receive another 7. We then receive frames 4, 5 and 6, so 4, 5 and 6 have been received, not yet act we expect to receive another four. Receive this ACK, frame three has been acknowledged and we're allowed to send one more. And of course this could keep going. We may then receive the ACK for these three frames. Before we explain some concepts, try and work out what happens What happens if, to continue this diagram, destination B sends this ACK, it's noted RR here, which is, what is it, receive request, I think, it's on the next slide. But from our perspective so far, it's an acknowledgement saying, I expect to receive frame 3 next. I expect to receive frame 4 next. If B sends an act saying I expect to receive frame 6 next, what happens for the window at A and at B? 
try and calculate or determine what the window would look like at both A and B. You don't have to draw the entire window, but from the source A, those three values, last frame act, what is the value? Last frame transmitted. and the current window size, the size of the blue box. What are those three values for the source A after it receives this act? And similar for destination B, what are the values of its three variables? B has last frame, what do they call it? Last frame. Last frame received and current window size. Find the answers or what find the values of those three variables at both the source and at the destination B. B sends back an act saying with the number, or what we call an acknowledgement, number six. Any answers? What's the last frame act from A's perspective? Yep. When will they act? When, when do you send an act? In, it's different. In this case, we send an act at this time after receiving three frames. In this specific case, we send an act after receiving this frame. I'll explain later why you'd send an act at a different time. But in general, you can send an act at any time. In this example, at this point in time, we now send an act with acknowledgement number six. So. A receives that last frame act. Previously, we had this four, five, and six were outstanding. It receives an act saying, I now expect to receive frame six. So be careful here. This number indicates the next frame expected. It doesn't indicate the last frame acknowledged. There's a difference. So if we've sent four, five, and six, and we receive an act saying B expects to receive six, that must mean four and five have been act. So the last frame act would be five. If I try to draw that diagram from A's perspective, not A, the 
this diagram, four, five, and six were outstanding. We received an act saying we expect to receive frame six. That must mean four and five have been successfully act. So the last frame act is five. What was the last frame transmitted by source A? What was the last frame transmitted? Again? Six. Nothing has changed. A has sent three, four, five, six. The last one transmitted was six. We receive an act. It hasn't sent any more, so the last transmitted is still six. What's the current window size then? Six. The maximum window size is seven. The last frame transmitted is six. So we think of that's one frame outstanding. We've sent but not yet act. We're now allowed to send a maximum of seven. One plus another six. So we say that this is the current window size. Six frames. So note that current window size measures the number of frames. These two record the sequence number of a particular frame. Frame with sequence number five, frame with sequence number six, current window size equals six frames. because the maximum outstanding allowed is seven. And similar, what happens from B? We've sent an act for four and five, because we sent an act saying we're expecting to receive six. That implies four and five have been act. So we'd move to here, and this blue box would move along by two. In essence, we acknowledge two frames received, which allows us, or then we expect to receive another two frames. If I acknowledge two frames, I give the transmitter an opportunity to send another two frames. So the last frame act, what's the answer? Last frame act. Five. It, it was three. We received an act saying we expect to receive six. That implies frames four and five have been act. Last frame received was six. And the window size would be also six because we've received one. We expect to receive a maximum of seven. So we can receive another six frames. What's happening and where do we get the sliding window name from? The blue box is the window as we transmit and receive, transmit data frames and receive acts, it slides along. If we had an infinite number on, of sequence numbers here, you can see at the start the window has a size of a seven. As we transmit frames, it closes on the left. It goes from seven down to four. As we receive acts, the window opens on the right. And as we transmit frames, it closes on the left. Receive acts, it opens. If we transmit three frames, it closes by three frames there. That's the concept of a window which can open and close and also slides along as we transmit and receive frames. Both at the sender and the receiver, that same concept applies. Although we haven't looked at the performance, one thing you would notice, and then we'll finish, is that the source can send multiple frames before it has to wait for an act. 
In this case, the source can send a maximum of seven frames. We could send frames zero through to six, and then we'd have to wait for an app. Our stop and wait, we send one frame, wait for an ACK. The best case for our source, if we have sliding window, I'm going to run out of space, cut them in half. One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, too many. Frames 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are allowed to be transmitted before we have to wait for an act. And then we can send more. So even if we have a long propagation delay, we're still transmitting. Compare these two. In this case, this is the time spent transmitting, this is the time spent waiting very inefficient. Here, time spent transmitting, time spent waiting, more efficient than this case. So in the best case, we can send up to W max frames and then have to wait for an act. And that increases the efficiency compared to stop and wait. That's as I said, more complex than stop and wait. There's new concepts introduced. What we'll do next week is to go through a more concrete example where we have some numbers, data transmission time, propagation time, and so on, to reinforce this concept. Any questions so far? Okay, we've got sequence numbers in all our frames now. They wrap around. In our example, we have a three-bit thread sequence number allows us to have values 0 up to 7, and then we wrap around to 0 again. The source and receiver keep track of the frames that have been sent and acknowledged, that have been sent but not yet acknowledged, and the frames that are allowed to be sent. The window size indicates the number of frames we're allowed to send. And similar to the receiver, the frames that have been received and acknowledged, frames that have been received but not yet acknowledged, and the frames that we expect to receive in the future. And as we send and receive frames, these values change, and we get the concept of some window that slides along, with the idea that we can spend more time transmitting than waiting. there was still some question about why did we send one ACK here after receiving three frames and in this case we received one frame and then sent an ACK immediately. So that's a question we'll try to answer. We'll answer that in more detail next week but it depends on many factors in when are these frames arriving, how often they arrive, how long the receiver is expecting to wait before it sends an ACK. So it's sometimes very difficult to determine what the receiver will do. But in general, it can do either of those cases. Wait and send an act later or send an act immediately. Any questions before we look at something else? We will go through a more e e detailed example next week. Are we having a quiz next week? I can't remember the schedule. Have a look at the schedule. Any questions? Let's let's stop there.